I mean, fear, you, you face, you got to have fear. Fear is critical to survival. You know, it teaches you respect. Every time I put that diving helmet on, I literally say, Dave, if you're not careful, this could be the last time you're putting this helmet on. So you live with fear, but it's a healthy fear. You have to have that fear. Okay, fair enough. Sometimes you get fear that's not healthy, um, but you learn to cope with that, you know. When you've done it for years and your training's been good, you learn to cope with certain fears and, and I guess, be calm. So fear is part of my life in, in a lot of the things that I do, not only diving, you know. You have to embrace fear. Imagine, it has been three and a half weeks since you last saw the sun. The darkness is only broken by the light of the lamp of another diver working on a big oil pipe. The only thing that is between you and death is a rubber suit and your umbilical, providing you with oxygen and hot water. In case of an emergency, the descent takes more time than an astronaut would take to fly to the moon. In this interview, I'm talking to David Gibbs, a saturation diver whose workplace is more than 150 meters under water surface and absolute darkness. This podcast brings you stories from and about people who stepped into the unknown, stories about fear, uncertainty, the illusion of security or... I don't know. Let's see what it will be about. My name is Katarina Bayer and I will host you on this journey into the unknown. Saturation diver, can you explain me what a saturation diver is? Hi, Katerina. Um, have you ever dived before? No, I've never dived in my life. Well, if you've experienced a little bit of diving, you'd understand um, what pressure your body experiences when you dive. Saturation diving is essentially being put under that pressure for an extended period of time so that you don't have to decompress on a daily basis. You do... One long stint under pressure, and then at the end of your time in the water or the time in saturation, you'll do a long, slow decompression. So it's one decompression that um, covers you for an extended period of time under pressure. When you say an extended period, how long do you go underwater? Typically, saturation times are 28 days. You don't really go beyond 28 days, but there are obviously cases where you can go beyond 28 days. Obviously, if a saturation job is short, you'll only be down there for two or three days, you know, before you start decompressing. So I know the gear that a normal diver has, right, with these two oxygen bottles on the back and stuff. Can I imagine it like this or is it totally different? Well, you're still getting supplied with the gas. The oxygen bottles on your back will supply you with gas. That's scuba, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. When you're saturation diving, you're not self-contained. You're tethered with an umbilical, and that supplies you with, with everything you need to stay alive underwater while you're working. Um, you still have air on your back or gas on your back, but uh, that is purely for emergencies. If your main supply through your umbilical fails, you have what we call a bailout mm -hmm. and you'll go into your bailout bottle, which is on your back, and that gives you enough time to get to the refuge of your dive bell. So that means, I just put it in my own words and you're correct. So it means like you go like approximately 150 meter below water surface at a pressure that is 15 times the atmosphere pressure. You stay there for almost a month And you almost have no visibility and the only thing that you have that is like your lifeline is this umbilical cord and this is connected 
to, you called it a bell when you explained it to me first. And there's a person that gives you, um, energy, that gives you the oxygen and that gives you also the, 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 the energy for the, for the headlamp. And you just dive down there to repair things at a structure or a pipeline. Is this more or less what it is? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it is. Um, I can go into a little bit more detail about how everything's supplied to the diver. You have a dive bowl which goes on. Typically you have two guys in the bowl, maybe three guys in the bowl, three man bowl run. Now, obviously the bowl's lowered from the vessel that you're on. The bowl is supplied also through a very big umbilical. And from the bowl, it gets split up into your diving supplies and then you supply it from the bowl whatever you need, you know, your gas, your hot water, because sometimes you're diving in very cold water and you need hot water to be circulating around you to keep you warm. Yeah. And um, obviously your gases, you have uh, power for your lights. You need lights down there because it gets very dark. Hot water, gas, lights, camera, because everything's monitored. Communications, you need to be able to communicate with the people on the surface. They need to be able to communicate with you. And yeah, you know, that's those are the essentials that you need to go to your job underwater. Can you explain how this works? Like you, you jump now out of the bell in your suit that looks like an astronaut suit for me, and then you just slide down to the ocean surface. You have no visibility. How do you start working there? I mean, is it? I imagine it. You're almost blind, and you just find your way, or. It depends. Not uh, a lot of your work that you do is very limited visibility. Sometimes absolutely no visibility. Other times it's like diving in gin, where you have visibility for more than a hundred meters. You know, so obviously those are nice conditions to dive in, and then you obviously have bad conditions where you are literally feeling your way around the seabed, around a structure that you're working on. But you get quite used to it. You know, in the beginning. It's uh, it's all foreign because you're working off diagrams that you've been given of a structure that you've got to go work on and you've got to translate, you've got to create your own mental picture in your head of exactly what it feels like down there because um, eyesight is is nothing down there. So you, it's purely tactile. But you get a good mental picture in your head after two or three dives on a particular structure. You can pretty much land anywhere on that structure, feel a valve handle, feel a bolt, feel the flange, and you'll know exactly where you are on that structure. So, yeah. And do you have like a communication thing in your ear that people say like go more to your right or something? Is there any communication with the vessel or the one in the bell? You have communications with your dive supervisor. You're always speaking to the dive yeah. supervisor who is on the vessel. He can guide you because uh, one of the things that you do have – is an acoustic beacon mm -hmm. and you have a survey team on board and the survey team can actually pinpoint exactly where you are on the seabed. So in zero visibility or poor visibility conditions, the supervisor will also have a survey screen in dive control and he can actually ping you and see exactly where you are relative to where you need to be and um, he can guide you. Okay, you need to go a little bit more to the left, five meters to the left and he can see exactly where you are based on the acoustic beacon that you're carrying with you. Does it mean that you go to places where nobody else has ever been before underwater? In some cases, you go to places where nobody's been before. In other cases, you go to places where very few people have been before. You never go to places where hundreds of people have been before because there are no pedestrians down there. <laughs> and very often, a lot of the jobs, you'll be the first people on site a lot of the structures that get installed get installed almost remotely without divers and when there are problems, obviously divers have to intervene, go down and you'll be the first person on the job and that, I guess in cases like that, yeah, nobody's been there before, you know. Yeah, every, every, every dive is different. You face with different challenges on one day You might have beautiful visibility on the next day. There could be zero visibility. On the one day, you might have tide that really affects you. And the next day, there'll be no tide. So it always changes. It's, it's always, you've got to be ready for that change all the time and prepared for that change. And I, I guess that you also don't know what we will face down there because the people send you to repair something, but you don't know how the repair will look like, right? Absolutely. You know, it's um, if you're the first diver on site, 
and there's a, for example, a, a burst pipeline, mm. you, you'll obviously we, we'll plan the dive so that you're approaching from a safe from a safe um, direction, i.e., up current. If there's an oil leak, you don't want to approach the leak down current because you're going to get covered in oil, which isn't good for you. And yeah, you'll just you'll you'll be the first person to discover what the actual problem is or what it actually looks like, you know. And then from there, you'll you'll formulate a plan on on what you're going to do to repair. So you said already you, you mentioned decompressing. So when you um, come from the vessel, are you in a certain boat that takes you down, or how does this decompression work? And how many people are actually working in such a small chamber all together? I mean, you said already it's three people in the bell, but can you can you talk a bit about the team that is behind such a such a work thing? There's a, I mean, it's a massive team. You, you have, uh, let me start from the beginning. We don't, we, uh, saturation divers do not live underwater. That's a, a, quite a big misconception when you talk about saturation diving and you say you're living in chambers. We don't live underwater. We work underwater. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine a big chamber complex built into the vessel or put onto the back of a vessel, saturation system can comprise of, uh, one chamber, two chambers, I've been in big complexes that have four chambers. A big complex will house three three man teams plus a team that's on deco, so it can it can um, accommodate twelve divers. Other systems can only accommodate six divers. To get to work in a very layman's terms, if you could imagine you're on the ship in a chamber under pressure. And you have a dive bell, which is also under pressure. You transfer through to the dive bell. The dive bell gets lowered to the ocean, just like an elevator, all the way down. When you get to your working depth, the bottom door of the bell, you'll open the bottom door, and then you're at your working depth pressure, and then divers will get dressed in. Typically, like I said, you have um, a two-man team or a three-man team. If it's a three-man team, one of the divers will be a dedicated bellman, The other two divers will be the divers that will be excurting out of the bell. The bellmen will be in charge of uh, controlling their umbilicals, looking at all their services from the bell, which is also monitored from the surface by the dive supervisor and the life support staff. So going back to your question about the people around, like I said, the divers, you can be um, in a six-man system, you can be in a 12-man system, a nine-man system. And those are your divers. Now you need life support staff to support life in the chambers. These people obviously monitor the quality of gas you're breathing, um, making sure that uh, carbon dioxide levels don't get too high, making sure oxygen levels are exactly where they should be, um, controlling your environment. They can, If you want the temperature to come up, you can ask the life support staff, please crank up the temperature to two <laughs> degrees. You know? and, They give um, you food? As well, uh, yeah, foods, foods, um, part of the life support team's <laughs> job. You know, food gets uh, sent in. You get uh, basically when you come back from a dive, you'll get given a menu. You'll order your lunch or whatever meal you're having according to the menu. The menu will get sent out, or you'll let the life support staff know who wants what, and then they will prepare the meal for you on the outside, and it gets sent into the chamber via a medical lock. We call it a medical lock, which is just a pressurized lock system, which enables you to transfer food from the outside, one atmosphere, to wherever you are, 15 atmospheres, if you're at 150 meters. And um, so this is the life support staff, and then outside of that, you've got obviously your dive supervisors who control the diving Life support staff control life in the chambers. Dive supervisors control everything from when the bell leaves the surface and goes down to the bottom. And then um, you also have a big deck team because a lot happens uh, when the bell gets locked off the system and returns to the system. You have to have guys on deck controlling the or assisting with the descent and recovery of the bell. You also need tools deployed. Um, you might be lifting massive structures off the back deck of the sh of, of the ship and landing them on the seabed. So you need riggers, you need crane operators, you need surveyors. I've mentioned the surveyors before. 
um, for positioning of structures that you're landing on the seabed or, re- or recovering structures. And then you've got a massive marine crew, the whole, the whole ship that's essentially there to support one person or two people that are on the seabed. When you have one or two divers on the seabed, everything on that vessel is focused on the, on that one or those two divers on the seabed. It has to be. That's how it is. Mm. And you, you mentioned already you're not alone in the chamber. And so these chambers, is it like bunk beds and you're like in a, I don't know, you're 20 and sleeping in a bunk bed while you're in Australia in a holiday or how, how can I imagine this? How is life in this, in this chamber? Well, you get, um, different systems. Some systems are really small and tight where you'll get, uh, six guys in one chamber, bunk beds. And, um, no privacy, I guess. No privacy or very little privacy, but, uh, you learn to respect each other's very small space. If you can imagine, you've already, your, your world's been reduced to this really small area that you're living in. You can literally touch the roof and the walls and that's round. And you've got six people living in a chamber that might be six meters long by two meters in diameter. You get bigger systems, which are obviously a lot more comfortable, but um, I'm not giving you the worst case scenario <laughs> where, I mean, I did one, the longest saturation I did was 54 days in Israel. I couldn't stand up straight. The chambers were that small. I'm quite a tall guy and I couldn't stand up straight for that entire period. The only time I could straighten myself out was when I was lying on my bunk or when I was in the water. And there it's lovely to go. I mean, you want to dive. You want to get out of that <laughs> confined space. So going for a dive is fantastic. You know, you, you get out, you get to stretch your legs and arms properly. How long is a dive usually? Typically, you'll, lock, you'll, you'll be deployed from your chamber on the ship, go down and do your job, and eight hours later you'll be locked back onto the chamber and then the next shift will, will swap out with you. The shift that's just come back will go into the chamber. A new shift goes into the bell. They'll do a series of bell checks, internal, external bell checks, and off they'll go pick up from where you left off on the seabed. So for me, it sounds pretty risky what you're doing. So my question is like, how do you came up with this idea? Like, I want to be a saturation diver. Was it that you just wanted the riskiest job on the planet? Or was it something that you dreamed of as a kid already? Like, what was your inspiration to do that? To go back to the first part of your question on the risk factor, sure, it's a, it is a risky environment. Things change all the time. Conditions change. I guess you're also up against marine animals, and uh, I mean the biggest the biggest change there are your environmental conditions. Um, you're obviously very deep. There is no way out of there. There is no quick way out of there. If you, like, for example, if you're air diving and something happens to you, you can come straight to the surface and you can get sorted out. When you're saturation diving, you are, if I give an example, it takes three days for astronauts to return to Earth from the moon. Now, three days decompression would be, would be equivalent of about 80 meters diving depth in saturation. So if you're at 80 meters, it's going to take you three days before you can decompress to safety. And so literally, if a diver is at 80 meters, he's actually further away from Earth as we know it than the astronauts were from the moon. And obviously deeper than that, 150 meters, you're looking at seven-day, eight-day decompression. So you're far away. There is no quick way out. You can, you'll die if you have a a fast decompression or get severely injured. I've always, I've always loved the water. I've always loved diving. I've always loved to immerse myself underwater ever since I was a kid. So, so naturally when I left school, I wanted to dive and uh, got into diving, joined the Navy. And from there, after the Navy, became a commercial diver. And I guess natural progression for me. Not for everybody, but for me and a lot, a lot of others, um, natural progression when you become a commercial diver is to go to the highest level of diving that you possibly can, and that is saturation diving. And yeah, it's just a, it's just a step to where you want to be. And I wanted to be a saturation diver because it doesn't, I guess you could say, it doesn't get better than that. You know? <laughs> 
It does, and it's, it's, it's not about uh, being an adrenaline junkie or anything. Look, the conditions are, are, they are, you are in a hostile environment. It is very risky, but, um, there's so many procedures and checks in place that actually make the job quite safe. You know? Um, you taught well. I, I think lack of experience is probably the riskiest factor that you can have in a sat in a sat diver. So experience is very important too. And yeah, always wanted to do it and got to do it and very happy I did it, you know. And it's like the best place to be. Mm. <laughs> Mm. How many of these dives can you do per year? Physically, you can spend 365 days under pressure. You know, not that anybody's done that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what the physi physiological effects would be of that. But if you can spend a month under pressure, you can spend a year under pressure. Yeah, but you don't have any sunlight, no nature, no pets, no no green thing to look at. I mean, that's just part of the job. You kind of count that out. You know, so. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You, there's a lot you can't do. You can't drink. You can't smoke. You can't do anything when you go into saturation. So you turn that off. When that door closes, yeah. when you get put into the chamber for the first time, before you get pressurized, it's goodbye world. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, you're entering a totally new world and you focus on that. You know, that's why it's also so important to, for saturation divers to want to be there. You can't not want to be there. It's one of those things that you, You have to want to be there in order to enjoy it, you know. What is the most pleasurable thing about saturation diving? I guess the nicest thing about saturation diving, looking at it from a productive point of view, is you get to go underwater to really deep depths and you will get to dive for eight hours uninterrupted normally you would have to go through decompression after really short periods of time like for example if you were diving on air to 40 meters you would your maximum bottom time at 40 meters would probably be be about maybe half an hour and then you'd have to do decompression after that not a particularly long decompression but you'd have to decompress after that so and you'd need a massive team so it's really not productive to Deeper than a certain depth, it's really not productive to do surface diving. In other words, diving with air from the surface down and then decompressing straight after your dive. The nice thing about saturation diving is when you're on the seabed, you've got a lot of time to do whatever you need to do. There's, it's, it's, there's uh, The pressure of needing to get things done really quickly isn't there, which is great because you've got continuity and you actually get your whole lot more productive, you know. I met your mother some days ago and mm -hmm. I asked her how you were as a little kid and what was really special. And she said to me that when you were in school, you always wrote stories and illustrated them and it was always out in the ocean. Yeah, I guess that's where it started, you know. <laughs> always had a fascination. I mean, Jacques Cousteau was, when I was a young boy, was my hero, you know, and uh, I would just marvel at what he did, you know which in today's terms is pretty commonplace. But when I was a kid, it was magical. Yeah. So, when, when I think about going underwater, and this is always why I was afraid of the ocean, is these big animals that live there. Like, have you had any animal encounters that were like something that usually a normal person wouldn't have? Personally, no, there have been some encounters, but... You know, I, I guess the first thing that jumps into everybody's mind is, aren't you scared of sharks? And, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I've seen hardly any sharks and I wouldn't deem sharks as being a threat to divers underwater, you know. Um, they're far more dangerous things that are the size of your shoe that can actually kill you, you know, or injure you badly. For example, stonefish. I mean, when I was working in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, Uh, there were stonefish everywhere. Mm. And you put your hand on a stonefish, you're going to be in a lot of grief, you know, mm. and potentially yeah, anything. You can you can die from it. Um, working in, in Asia, I can remember being swamped by 
just a massive amount of jellyfish where I was just stung from top to bottom jellyfish, you know. And that was, that was horrific. And when I, where I was at the time, the vessel I was on, I got to the surface, I could feel myself going into anaphylactic shock from all the stings. I went to the barge master and I said, look, we need to do something about this. Do you have any antihistamine or something like that? And he gave me a bottle of vodka. (laughs) (laughs) So. Did it help? Yeah, yeah. And, and, And I mean, more recently, you talk about sharks. I've just actually come off a job now. It wasn't a saturation job. It was an air job that we were doing. I still dive. There were a lot of sharks. And they were big sharks and they were bull sharks and Zambezi sharks, notorious for biting people, you know. But uh, they never bothered us at all. It was actually quite beautiful seeing these massive creatures underwater. And they were there every day, all day, looking at us, just curious. Didn't bother us. Came close. But, um, yeah, the little creatures are the dangerous ones. <laughs> you already made the analogy to astronauts and when I first m- met you I was like oh you're an underwater astronaut and astronauts even train underwater to be prepared for flying to the moon why do you think everybody knows about astronauts but nobody knows about saturation divers probably because Hollywood hasn't got hold of us yet <laughs> I mean, everybody, it's easy for people to stare into space and look at stars thousands of light years away and uh, it's difficult for people to see what's happening under the water. I don't know. I think that might be a limiting factor. You look at comic books and and, and, uh, fiction, is is so much written about space and very little written about what we do underwater, you know. So you're not just diving yourself, but you also like supervise a team of divers. So you would be on the vessel and supervising them, right? Yeah, that's sort of another the process that you go through or I've been through is uh, from commercial diver to saturation diver and then from there to saturation su- uh, supervising. And um, now I'm running operations as the dive superintendent. Because... There is this documentary about on Netflix that you pointed out to me. It's called Last Breath. And I think when we talk about saturation diving, we have to talk about uh, responsibility and trust. Because what I saw in this movie, and maybe you can, you can share something about your experience about responsibility and trust. It's like, if something happens, it's a very deadly place or a very, very um, hectic place and something happens. Everybody has to trust each other and there's so much responsibility that also the people on, on deck have on the vessel. Um, what, what does it mean for you feeling responsible for people who are underwater and, and what does trust, what did you learn about trust on all your excursions that you did? Teamwork is, is paramount in a situation, in, 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 in our environment, uh, because we rely on absolutely everybody and everybody relies on everybody else. So teamwork is important and um, obviously trust is uh, super important, especially your fellow divers, the people that you're in the bowl with, the people that you're underwater with. There's always a high level of trust. Trust to the point where there's expectation. You know that if something happens to you, your bowman is going to come rescue you. can't always rely on trust. Although it's nice, that's why choosing people in your teams is so important because you know who you're choosing. Very often you'll get a list of names to put a team together and you don't know those people. You cannot trust people you don't know. So it's it's very important and I try my best to, when I do put a, a team together, is to choose the people I know, you know. And um, I like a mix of people. Yeah, very important. Trust, honesty, openness. Is, is, is paramount in, in my game. And what does safety mean to you? You can also answer generally, but what is safety? Well, safety is obviously paramount. I'm not a fan of people getting hurt or people dying, so I try my absolute level best to make sure things happen safely. Once again, trust and knowing the people that are in the water plays a big role because if you know the people that are in the water for you, 
you know exactly what they're capable of doing and you can give certain people certain tasks that you couldn't give other people. So it's very important to know that. That's a major safety thing. We also, on the safety side of things, there are procedures, emergency drills that are trained. There are, there are procedures for absolutely everything. I mean, if I want to go brush my teeth, for example, in the chamber, I let the people on the outside know I'm going to go brush my teeth and they know they need to come and turn on the water at the basin for me and they need to flush that basin for me. Similarly, when you go to the toilet as well, um, you need people on the outside to assist you flushing the toilet and uh, and the procedures for absolutely everything. When things go wrong, emergency procedures are there, you know, and, and they get drilled on every single job. At the start of each job, You'll go through a series of, of, of emergency drills. Also during the job when there's, when there breaks, you'll, you'll focus, the dive supervisors will do emergency drills with the divers. So everybody is kept on their toes and know what to do when things go bad, when things go wrong. Yeah. Did, did in any of your jobs anything go, got really wrong once? Recently, we had an incident with, um, we were fixing a pipeline. There was a lot of oil, and these uh, hydrocarbons are are quite toxic. Well, they're actually very toxic, and we had obviously hydrocarbons got into the bell, and two of the divers in the bell became totally yeah. almost paralysed. It's it, it's frightening because. Um, I was called to dive control by the supervisor. Dave, you need to come to dive control now. Okay. And normally when I'm called to dive control, it's uh, especially the tone that I was called. I knew something was wrong, went down to dive control, and we've obviously got video feed from the bell, and I was looking at these two divers and asking them to do really basic things, you know, and they couldn't. They were They were clumsy. Fortunately, one of the divers was okay, and um, he sort of managed. We the situation was managed through this one particular diver who wasn't that affected by it, and and that and that sort of saved the situation. It, um, but it could have been, it could have got a lot worse, and it was stressful. I mean, I was already thinking of um, emergency decompression, getting the bell up. Um, to a shallower depth where we can intervene, where we can put air divers down to, to help the situation, you know. And other, I mean, uh, incidences like that, like because I said uh, there's so many procedures in place um, and protocol to follow, incidences like that are, are quite rare. I mean, you watch the last breath, yeah. that, that is a super rare uh, um, occurrence, you know. But what was so stunning for me with this last breath is that the person who almost got killed and nobody actually knows why he survived anyhow, he just went back to a dive. So did you ever ask yourself the question like after an incident or after a really hard job, like how long can I do this? Because it, it sounds like a really, really risky and, and I mean, a, a very stressful job. Look, when things go wrong, they they can go wrong really badly. Yeah. Once again, it's very isolated. I think uh, the guy in the in the in the film that you're talking about, the diver himself, from my understanding, probably did the right thing. His umbilical got severed. The vessel couldn't hold position, and his umbilical got severed. Therefore, all he had with him was the gas on his back. Uh, hypothermia kicks in immediately because there's no more hot water. Yeah. And he had sense to make sure he could be found again. So he positioned himself, I think he might have even clipped himself off to the structure that he was on so that when the vessel returns, they'll be able to find him. Because if he had not been tethered off to anything or had not made a plan to put himself in a good position to be found again, Underwater currents could have taken him and would never seen him again. Although he would have had acoustic beacons on him as well, can find him through the survey system. But he obviously had good presence of mind to think a little bit ahead. And in those situations, that is brilliant, you know, because panic would normally just kick in, you know. So that's a guy, very calm, knew what to do, did exactly the right thing, and that enabled 
him to be recovered again. And, uh, yeah, fortunately, they took off his helmet and he took a breath, you know. How, how much did the job shape you in your personality? Well, it's been, it's, it's been a progressive thing. You know, it's, uh, when, you, when you're a diver, you, don't, you, you can think for yourself. You don't really have to think about much else. You know, you're obviously thinking about the job and, and you're getting instructions from somebody. You, you're always getting told what to do. And then obviously your own common sense might change things a little bit. But generally speaking, you're told what to do. There are no major decisions that you have to make. And then progressively you become a supervisor. And then all of a sudden you're making more decisions. Um, for the safety of the divers, for the safety of the saturation system, and obviously for the production of the job, you know, because we're there to do a job. The job's got to go on. You know? <laughs> and um, and then once you, or from um, going from supervisor to superintendent, you just have a whole lot more decision making to do. It's quite funny because I often look at that, and and uh, up until that point, there was always a go to person to answer your questions, but you know, you know, in a position where you make those decisions, there is, I mean, you can shoot ideas off other people, other experienced people, even off other divers, but ultimately you making those decisions and, um, they're very important decisions, you know, they obviously affect the safety and well-being of the divers in saturation and, uh, efficiency on the job, you know. Those decisions that, uh, so that's the weirdest thing and that's kind of shaped me, um, to teach myself that I'm fully capable of making any decision almost, you know, when it comes to diving yeah. and, and life in general. It's <laughs> also taught me, look, there's nobody else you can ask. Just bring in, do it yourself. Yeah. I have three last questions for you. The first one is, what is your biggest fear? Wow. Well, I think my biggest fear would be losing all of this, whatever the cause might be. And, um, I mean, I love what I do. I've always loved what I do. And um, I'll keep on loving what I do, I think. And, uh, yeah, my biggest fear is, 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 is losing that attraction to what I do. Um, losing your passion. Losing my passion for what I do. I mean, fear, you, you, you face, you got to have fear. Fear is critical to survival. You know, it, it teaches you respect. Every time I put that diving helmet on, I literally say, Dave, if you're not careful, this could be the last time you're putting this helmet on. So you live with fear, but it's a healthy fear. You have to have that fear. Okay, fair enough. Sometimes you get fear that's not healthy, um, but you learn to cope with that, you know. When you've done it for years and your training's been good, you learn to cope with certain fears and, and I guess, be calm. So fear is part of my life in, in a lot of the things that I do, not only diving, you know. You have to embrace fear. What are you currently doing that you still don't know how it will turn out? Do we ever have a clue what the result will be? We've got a good idea, but we can never be certain what the result will be. That's life. That's the way I like it, you know. <laughs> I, I, I always look around the next corner. You can't see around the next corner, but you've got to go around the next corner, you know. Uh, yeah, I fear. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, having died for so long, I'm not fearful of going underwater. Um, I mean, it's become second nature. Like working in zero visibility, you, you create this picture in your head. And after the first two or three dives on a particular structure, you know exactly where you are. So you're comfortable. Um, conditions can get rough and you can be uncomfortable. Uh, you can be diving in beautiful conditions at 150 meters and you can look around and the water's just like gin and it's beautiful and there's marine life and um, your pulse is is... Nice and low and calm, you know, until you get working. And um, But uh, if you're diving in harsh conditions, zero visibility, strong currents, which is often, um, your pulse is charging. 
your body's tense. Every single muscle in your body's tense because you're fighting to stay in position, to hold your position, and you sleep well at night <laughs> after that, you know. Um, but it's you get used to it. Harsh conditions, you get used to as well, like zero visibility after the first two or three dives of working in raging tides. You get used to it. But like you describe it, it's it's not just getting used to it, but it's actually enjoying it. Yeah, you have to enjoy it. Okay, you can't enjoy every single dive. Some dives you come back and say, oh, my goodness gracious, that was terrible. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> and you feel a bit um, embarrassed maybe because of lack of performance or doing something stupid, but that's life, you know. Everybody goes through that. The third question is more or less um, something I'll ask you for. So the aim of this podcast is, as you already mentioned, you don't really have a clue what's going to be next. And a lot of people are afraid of uncertainty and not knowing. So with this podcast, I want to talk to people to share their stories because people should should get a glimpse into all these unknown things. But I I learn from stories when I put them into action, you know, once it's just listening and the other thing is putting in into action. Do you have any task that the listeners could do, like any idea what, what they could do to bring your story into action? Like something that you learned from life that you can now hand over to the listeners and say, try this because this is how I deal with uncertainty. I think it was Steve Jobs who said, it's very easy to connect the dots behind you, but you've got to have faith that the dots will connect in front of you. And faith is is a big thing, you know. It's um, I mean, I'm not talking about faith in Jesus or anything like that. It's faith in yourself. You've got to have faith in yourself. And um, you go out there, you know your limits, very important. You need to know your limits. When things get out of control, you need to know when to to draw the line and say, look, I think I'm going to go back to the bowl. This is a bit rough, you know, and uh, I mean, life preservation is important. I don't want to die. I'm not a fan of, of death, you know. I, 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 and I'm not playing with death at all. I'm playing with life, you know. So, so to go back to your question... If you really wanted to get a small experience of what saturation is like, lock yourself in a storeroom for a month. After every 14 hours, or every 16 hours, sorry, climb out the bed or climb out that room's window and have a piece of rope connected to you. Go for a walk in the garden, go do some work, build something. Um, and at times blindfold yourself and go for that walk and go build something or fix something in your garden and then come back. And as soon as you come back, um, have a quick shower, order your food from somebody on the outside <laughs> and, and yeah, stay there and, 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 and just for fun, throw another five people into that room. <laughs> I really thank you a lot. Uh, a week ago, I had no idea that saturation diving exists and it's really a dive into the unknown. And, um, thanks for, for sharing it. Thanks for sharing it. Thanks for, for talking to me. No problem at all. My pleasure.